Hello, welcome to my YouTube channel today. Um, today's video is going to be about this 8086 uh, processor card. Um, I would highly recommend checking out my previous few videos that build up to building this card because I'm sure I'm going to miss relevant information when explaining this. I'm just going to ramble on for 10 or 15 minutes here. Um, and as you can see, it is, in fact, an 8086, not, uh, if you could read that, the, that's upside down, the 30, if you can read that. Um, so real quick, we'll start with what we were working with in the last video. So I left the board wired up, but I took off the, uh, video card, the I.O. card, and the, uh, it would have been the USB, uh, hard drive card. Just, uh, because I moved it over to an actual, just uh, another board. So this is now on a card. Uh, there's a few minor differences, but, uh, that, that's what this is. So, talking through the card, we've got our processor, and once again, this is in fact an 8086, not a V30. That's important because um, with the way the V30 is designed, it runs a lot more stable and at a lower, it can run at a lower voltage than the 8080, this particular 8086 anyway. And so sometimes you kind of get like a false positive on the system working with a V30, but it won't work with an 8086. And this board would not work with the 8086 and I, I think it just had to do with like stability of a bunch of wires everywhere um got our clock here and this is for the processor and the bus controller we've got um the crystal the reset uh you know capacitor and resistor reset buttons here um i'm gonna jump around so these three chips, and they're kind of in line with the uh, ISA slot. These are your address um, latches. So these are LS573s. Uh, um, so A, actually A1, so skip A0 for now, A1 through A19. And then bank high enable is also latched, but it's not displayed. It would be displayed on the 16-bit side but it's actually not displayed. That comes from the bus controller. We've got our transceivers. So the D8 through D15 transceiver is here. It is just straight pass through from the processor over. Um, and once again, you should see my previous videos to explain how this is wired up a little better, but the enable pin does not come from the data enable. It comes from the uh, bus controller. I've got a transceiver here, and um, I want to say this one is the straight pass-through from D0 through D7 on the uh, ISA. And then we have two additional a latch and additional transceiver. This additional transceiver goes from D0 through D7 through the transceiver to D8 through D15 on the processor. And that's for 8-bit operations. And the latch is for 8-bit operations We're doing a 16-bit read. It uh, goes from D0 through D7 on the ISA to D0 D7 on the processor. And that's so you can read the first byte, latch it, hold it there, read the next byte through the transceiver, and retrieve 16 bits of data from an 8-bit um, bus. Um, over here, I've got some, uh, not entirely logic, but logic. You've got a LS257 uh, here, and this is used for the memory read-write, I.O. read-write. I've been using it for most of my projects for quite a few years now. The only thing that's different on this compared to an 8088 is the I.O. mem uh, select off of the processor is inverted 
on the 8086 versus the 8088. So when you if you ever wire one of these up, you got to make sure that you're paying attention to that you're it, basically instead of the I/O right, it becomes the read uh, the memory right off of the the decoder there. I've got a LS125, and this is just for enabling some things. It's mainly used for the IOMEM 16 chip select coming off the 16-bit bus to tell the bus controller. So it, it's just an enabling circuit. I also ran the, the ALE signal for the ISA through here so that it goes to the hold off of the um, DMA controller so that it causes the uh, ALE to float down here. Um, kind of off subject or on subject, but the enable signal on everything here when the processor goes into a hold state, all of the uh, address and data needs to go into like a float status or tri-state or whatever they call it. But it needs to go inactive but able to just go whichever way that the DMA controller pulls it. And I don't know if the ALE is used, but that was the one thing that wasn't being currently uh, uh, floated like that. I've got an LS139 that's used for decoding a few things. It decodes for um, the read-write um, coming out. It's part of the bus controller here, and it also is used to enable uh, whether it's straight through the transceivers to the processor or using the auxiliary latch and transceiver to the processor. So it's just some decoding for that. And then the heart of the bus controller is here. Um, it's basically a ROM, and this one has to be a 640K ROM. Uh, it could be a lot smaller, but that's just, I have a lot of these on hand, so that's why I used it. And then a counter, and then an LS04, uh, then this is just to invert certain signals. So this has, and once again, check out my previous videos on how this actually functions, but the processor is held in a not ready state. And when the data enable goes active, originally I used the ALE to reset this, but when the data enable goes active, it starts the counter. And based on the address inputs for the IO16, the direction, um, oh, I can't remember right this second, but it decodes um, whether it's going to be an 8-bit to 16 read or a 16 to 16 read or 8-bit here, uh, you know, upper or 8-bit here. And... It counts up through control signals, and the, the D0 through D7 are used as control signals that control the, the read-write output and the, your transceivers. So, um, once again, check out my previous videos to get a much more in-depth explanation on, on how that works. The big thing about this video is just demonstrating that's all on a card now. Um, I included a header here, and that is, if you notice, there's no interrupt controller or system timer or DMA controller or memory on this card. Um, I've got things labeled, uh, so your interrupt, interrupt request, interrupt acknowledge, inter, non-maskable interrupt, hold and hold acknowledge, and then reset. Uh, one of these is the reset out from the clock and one of them's actually I think just the reset button. Uh, not all the pins are used by any means but it's just there to create a bridge to the to another card and during the development phase I'll probably build a, an additional card and that's where this card comes into play and this is my 8088 card that's been modified so this provides the interrupt controller, the system timer, the DMA, the uh, keyboard controller, and uh, USB, and the, the RAM and the ROM here. I took out the clock for the processor because it's now on this card here. And as you can see, this is just a 
this just plugs into that slot. So the intent would be to design a new card like this that has the same profile as this card and you could bridge them. But in all reality, I think it makes for a big card, but I would like to get it all on one card in the, in the end. But during the proto, because you, you don't want to take up three or four card slots. You, in the end, you know, for the prototyping though, it's good to have segments that you can work on individually. Now, one thing you'll note, this is 8-bit RAM and ROM. So the net, um, you know, which is working through just 8-bit. But the, the next step for me the, is going to be 16-bit uh, memory. And I'll, I will probably do a 16-bit ROM and a 16-bit RAM. So these two chips will come off and we'll start breadboarding on here. The one thing that I do get verification that the DMA controller works, but I have not been able to get a floppy drive to work in um, with 8-bit memory. I would think that when using only an 8-bit system, 8-bit memory, that an 8-bit DMA controller should work. But as of now, I haven't been able to get it to work. But everything else does work. It does test okay and check it, but it doesn't. It doesn't uh, read a floppy disk, which generally means the DMA controller is not functioning properly. So let's go ahead and boot this up, and we'll kind of demo it working. It runs very stable. Uh, note for myself, the ROM microcode is the 8-bit synced. So it's with the uh, processor clock, and it's got uh, one wait state. Um, I can run it without a wait state, but I did get one system crash, and I put in a wait state to prevent system crashes for now. So, let's, uh, uh it's probably not going to be fun to watch everything jumping around. Let's drop this down, and we'll see if we can get some things into focus here. So, put the card, hopefully I don't undo some wires. This is way more stable than the breadboard, obviously. And as you can see, this is, a, is an 8-bit uh, mini backplane here. And so you're only going to get like 8-bit uh, reads on the, the cards there. So the um, like the VGA card is only going to work in 8-bit. Let's see if we can get kind of a bigger shot here. So if you watched my other videos, this is definitely not running as fast as some of my other boards. There's quite a there's quite a delay doing an 8-bit to 16-bit read. Um, but it still runs fast enough. Let's go. Oh, I didn't plug in the keyboard. Generally you can plug a keyboard in after and it'll work. Yep, it worked. Um, I want to do the benchmark. So this is with the one weight state. And it's going to compare it to an original uh, 4.77 MHz 8088. So it does say it's an 8086. And it says it's 7.9 MHz, which is pretty close. And so the current PC is running at 1.6 times. IBM PC XT, mass speeds matched. Um, I'd say for this current project, that's acceptable. Without the weight state, I want to say it jumps up to 
two six or three six. What I really want to see is when I have 16-bit memory, RAM and ROM, not just not just RAM, how much of a jump that makes on the speed. So let's uh, test the system board. And this is where, you know, like I said, this is a six, or an 8-bit backplane, 8-bit memory, 8-bit RAM, the whole nine yards it's 8-bit the DMA or the DMA controller should work with a floppy disk and maybe now that it's not a bundle of wires and it's this system I've got a wider back plane I can grab and maybe it'll work um, maybe it just kind of like how the 8086 did not work on the uh, breadboard maybe it'll work now um, so here's the set system test the DMA controller channel 0 felled which is 100% typical for all of my projects because channel 0 was used for DRAM refresh and it's not connected at all on my system. So you, I've checked this before if if the, any other channels are not working it would list them here channel 0, 1, 2, whatever. Internet controller passed. Now this is where I'm going to go on a tangent but if I design this as a full 16-bit system it'll have both interrupt controllers and two DMA controllers and that's kind of like the slowdown right now is it took me a while to understand the DMA controller how to connect it on my original 8088 project so now I gotta figure out how they connected two DMA controllers you know ones for the data 0 through 7 and ones for data 8 through 15 and I'm pretty sure there's some 8-bit mode and 16-bit mode operations in there. So I've got to figure out how they did that and how to implement it to this custom system. So anyway, that's the that's kind of the update on the project. I've had this for about a week and a half now. I've just been away from home, so I haven't been able to post a video on it. But um, I would say it's like... I wouldn't say this is a perfect system, but for as few components as I'm using, it's functional. Um, and I've left this running for hours without a crash. And so it's it's functional. It seems to be stable. Um, I I think it's um, it's coming along the way I'd like it to. Some of the differences I'd like, though, is I still would like to have the um, bus controller have its own independent clock, which, when it was on the breadboard, I experimented with that, and it does work, but not always. It seems to run more stable when it's synced with the processor clock, and I, I can understand why, but... Anyway, that's the update. Uh, thanks for checking out the video today.